In this video, we are going to look at send and return tracks inside of Ableton Live. Let's take a look. Here I've got a really basic drum loop. And what I want to do is I want to have this snare be processed by reverb. So I come to my audio effects here and I go to reverb and I find reverb, I click and I drag and I drop it on the snare. Okay, so now I've got the snare on this channel. Let's have a listen. Okay, so I'm hearing the reverb applied to the snare. And I've got a dry wet control here that allows me to mix in how much of the signal I would like to be the original sound versus the reverbed sound. Okay. So 30%, 36% is reverb, the rest is dry, right? 100% is wet, 0% is dry, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I could do that if I had lots and lots of tracks here inside of Ableton Live. I could put a reverb on every single track, okay? If every track needed reverb. But I would very quickly run into a problem of processing power. If we're constantly putting reverbs on every single channel or track, that can start to put quite a heavy load on Ableton. So I'm going to introduce the idea of return tracks to you. And if we right-click here, we can go insert return track. And down here, you can see a return track has been placed inside of Ableton. Now, we already have some here loaded up by default. We've got an A reverb and we've got a B delay. Okay, so let's understand, we'll delete this one. Let's understand what these are. Okay, so we can see there's a reverb here. We can see there's a delay. And I'm going to attract your attention to these two little um rectangle boxes with negative infinity written in them, okay? So this is a send, and this is a return track, okay? So what we can do is we can send some of the snare into this return track. And on this return track, we have a reverb. So if we turn this all the way up to zero, and then we press play, and we turn off this reverb on the track, we can hear the sound is being reverbed. If I grab this and pull that all the way down, now I can no longer hear the reverb. So what is happening is that a certain amount of this audio is being sent into this track to be processed by this reverb. And then that audio is then going to the master and then we can hear it because the master is then going to our headphones or our speakers, okay? So if I put, say, negative 10, what happens? I still hear it, but it's not as loud. And that's because I'm not sending as much of the audio from the snare into the reverb. So it's just quieter. So I'll turn it all the way back up again. We're sending now more snare into the reverb the reverb is now louder because more signal is getting fed into it, resulting in more reverb occurring. And I can balance how much reverb I would like on the snare based upon where I set this value. So maybe I'll find that negative 32 is a good mix. I can barely hear it. I'm going to turn it up. Even that's too quiet. Cool. So I'm hearing that now in the background. And if I unsolo that and play it with the other instruments, now we're hearing that there's a bit of room or reverb applied to that sound. What if I want to also have the hi-hat be processed by the same reverb? Well, I can send that into there as well. And I do it at negative 14. Maybe that'll be the right amount. And I can just type the values in. So I go negative 14, enter. Okay, if I just want to hear what's happening with the reverb as I can solo this. I'll turn this up so we hear it more obviously. 
Okay, so that's the reverb that's being added. I'll unsolo it so I hear everything. And I'll mix that in. So I'll turn it off. Turn it back on. So it's adding ambience to the sound. It's adding a room or a you know a character to the sound. And this allows us to have multiple different sounds, but just process them with one reverb. There's a couple of reasons why this could be handy. Generally speaking, when you're recording a band or some kind of music, you would use the same recording room or similar sounding recording rooms. So if you use similar sounding reverbs, it sounds like your music is in the same acoustic space. If you are always using different sounding reverbs, you're going to have a lot of different sounding acoustic spaces. Now that could be cool, uh, but for the way I produce music, I like to have all my reverb sounds cohesive. I feel like it gels the track together better. So I often do this. I would make, say, three or four return tracks. And I would have reverb one as short verb. I'll, delete, I'll just delete this delay. Reverb two as, as um, medium verb. Long verb. And then rename insane verb. Right, and I would have, I'd copy this reverb. I'd place it here. I'd place one here and I'd place one here. So all of them have a reverb and then I'd go and I would change them. So the short reverb, the delay time, decay time, sorry, should be nice and short. Okay. The medium reverb. Okay. Maybe around there. The longer reverb. Cool. Maybe around three. And then the insane reverb could be like really long. Okay. And let's have a listen to how they sound just on the snare. Let's listen to that. So that's the short reverb. Turning it off. Cool. So you can hear what it's doing. Turn it back on. Turn it off and then use the medium reverb. Cool. Turn that off. Turn it back on. Bring it to level down. Turn up the long reverb. Okay, so that's giving us a real sort of cavernous vibe. And then if we go for the last one, the insane reverb. Okay, it's giving us a really deep vibes. Okay, so you can do that with reverb, but you can also do it with delays. You can do it with other sorts of effects. So you can get creative with what you have sending into a return track and what processing you have on that return track. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense for you. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you would like to see more, go ahead and subscribe and check out my other videos on YouTube. Thanks guys, and I'll see you soon.